Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Zach Ford. I am the chair of the Dusty Baker Sacramento Sabre chapter. Uh, we are very excited to have uh, Jill Guerin from the Vesalia Rawhide today. She'll talk about uh, her background, her experiences uh, being an announcer in baseball and um, also California League and recently uh, Arizona Fall League. Um, just a, a couple announcements. Please uh, make sure to mute yourselves. Um, there will be opportunity for uh, question and answers uh, later on um, after Jill speaks. Um, just a couple of announcements also. We'll likely take December off um, and then reconvene uh, sometime in January or February. Uh, Marlene will provide a little bit more information about the Sabre Day uh, event in a moment. Um, but also, if you are within the Sacramento vicinity, um, you probably are aware that the Club Pheasant is closing its doors at the end of the year. So we will look or we are looking for a person for in uh, person. Blah. We are looking for a location for in person meetings. So um, if you have any ideas, please let me know. Um, just something casual. I would definitely like to um, reconvene in person um, sometime early in the year. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Marlene and Steve. They'll have a couple of announcements and then I'll introduce Jill. Hi, and welcome. It sure is good to see all of you. Um, sight for sore eyes and so many of you tonight. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're starting to work on our Sabre Day uh, program and we've talked to John Leonardakis. Um, many of you know John from his uh, his being a guest with us many times over the years, but he's got a new documentary out um, on Ball Four and uh, it's the 40th anniversary, right? Um, and we thought that would be an interesting topic and probably a couple of other speakers too. Um, Saber Day is February 4th. Uh, we're not sure if that's going to be the exact date of our meeting. I'm, I'm waiting to hear when uh, Saber has the big meeting. Um, Leslie's on the line. I don't know if Leslie has a date for that, but uh, we'll keep you posted. And uh, we're just glad that all of you could join us for these Zoom meetings. And, and thanks for being here, Steve. Thank you, Marlene. Hello, everybody. Glad you're all here. I have nothing to add except to say that I'm very eagerly looking forward to hearing uh, Jill. This is a fascinating uh, couple of you know, intersections of subject matter here. I'm particularly eager to, to hear from Jill as a lifelong California League fan, the San Jose Bees, I want to tell you. <laughs> so far I go back. So we're eager to hear from you, Jill. All right. Uh, well, um, as we've made reference to, we are very excited to have uh, Jill Guerin tonight uh, from the uh, Visalia Rawhide. She's been an announcer with them since 2019. Uh, she did become the first female announcer in California League history. Um, at that time, she became one of three female broadcasters in minor league baseball. Um, she's also announced uh, some games for the uh, Reno Aces. She did make her major league debut um, at Dodger Stadium earlier this year and recently called games for the Arizona Fall League. So welcome very much. Uh, welcome. Thank you for having us or thank you for being with us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I see a few familiar faces. I know that I've met Perry before and I think that's Tracy who I know from the athletics. So it's great to see all of you again. Um, thank you again for having me here. So again, my name is Joel Guerin. I am the play-by-play -play broadcaster for the Visalia Rawhide, which is the single-A affiliate for the Arizona Diamondbacks. So that's a connection with the Reno Aces, which is the AAA team. And then, of course, my uh, innings that I got to do at uh, Dodger Stadium for the Diamondbacks, which was a lot of fun. Obviously, dream come true in, in that moment. Um it's so it's so funny whenever people ask me to talk because you know, I'm I'm 26. I feel like I don't have a, a whole lot to say. I still have a lot to go in in my career and in my life. But 
I think it, it all really started with my love of baseball. I first started playing baseball when I was six, made the transition to softball when I was eight and have been lucky enough to play softball throughout my entire collegiate career, which really kind of propelled my understanding of this sport to a whole new level where when I was watching games growing up, I wasn't listening to the broadcaster. I was, I mean, obviously I was, but I wasn't doing it in a critiquing way of, oh, I like how he said that. I like that they said it this way. I wish they did this instead. I was looking at as an athlete, I was looking at do they swing at a good pitch? What was their mindset there? I want to ask JD, like JD Martinez, what his thought process was on a two, one count. That's what I was looking at as an athlete, which I think has really allowed my career to be a little bit different and my relationships and friendships with players to be a little bit different as well. Not only am I around the same age as them, although with the Rawhide this year, they all called me mom, which is a little ridiculous. <laughs> um, I am around their age. I've played fairly recently. It's only been four or five years since I haven't played competitively. And I get that the sport like kicks you when you're down a lot. So I think they appreciate my understanding of that. Um Going into the actual broadcasting part of my career, I decided to do this when I was 12 years old. I knew a lot about sports. I have been talking about sports for a long time. One time in middle school, the guys were teasing me. Girls aren't supposed to know about sports. You don't know what you're talking about. And I came home and vented to my mom, which I've done every single day after that, basically. And she told me, well, Jill, you talk a lot and you know a lot about sports. Why don't you go into sports broadcasting? And 12-year-old Jill took it and ran with it and made a career. Um, I did not really focus on broadcasting a lot. I didn't really do anything in high school. Even in college, I definitely made softball my main priority, which looking back on it, I don't recommend that to anyone whenever I'm talking to college students or people who want to do this. It just worked for me. I did a few games, but my big internship was with the Boston Red Sox in 2018. I met Tim Neverett, who is now one of the broadcasters for the Dodgers, and he has become a huge mentor for me. So Tim, he got me a job with the Nashua Silver Knights, which is a summer collegiate team in New Hampshire. And because of that, I got maybe 10 games in because I had a lot of games with the Red Sox, but I got 10 play-by-play -play games in. And then... I was able to get a reel together. I heard the Rawhide had an opening, so I reached out. I happened to know someone there who went to Emerson also. That's where I went to college. And the rest is kind of history where my, my playing of the sport, I feel like I keep going back to that because the more I've reflected on my career a little bit, I just think that that has pushed me so far where I got the Red Sox internship because I knew baseball so well. And I think if I didn't play softball, I wouldn't have known how to score the game. That was a huge part of my job as an intern was to score the game because Joe Castiglione would leave for an inning or so because he wanted to go talk to someone and he'd come back and look at my book and say, okay, I need to write this down. Or Joe would whisper in my ear, hey, can you find out the last time this, this, or this happened? And I had to know how to find that. So my love for sports, my understanding of the game as an athlete, I think has really just set me apart a little bit. Um, that's how I got to the rawhide. Since then, I've had amazing opportunities, like, like Zach said, where I was able to broadcast for the Reno Aces as a color analyst, which again is so different. Not many people who are play-by-play -play broadcasters get to do that. And part of it is because of my playing background. That's something that I'm realizing I need to kind of market a little bit more to get more job opportunities. Um, the Arizona Fall League was an amazing opportunity that they specifically last year wanted to give it to people who are minorities. So women and people of color um, got this opportunity. This last year is a little bit um, different where they kind of were just trying to find people that were more local. And with me being based in Los Angeles, it's easy for me to get there. So I had an opportunity to do that. And then of course, the big one that everyone wants me to talk about are the, the innings at Dodger stadium. So that's 
where I realized how much of this career is luck and networking, where yes, it's preparation. Yes, I had to be ready for it. But like, I, I got lucky, you know, I was able to reach out to Scott Geyer, the vice president of the uh, of broadcasting for the Diamondbacks. He'd emailed me once before just saying, hey, want to keep in touch with all the broadcasters and the affiliates, which is a really nice thing to say. Like, th- you know, this guy is hundred of levels higher, more important than me, you know, and he wanted to reach out, which is nice. And when I happened to be in Arizona last year for the fall league, I emailed him saying, I'd love to meet him in person since I'm going to be in town. And he took me to lunch. He gave me a tour of Chase Field. And when we were in the radio booth, he showed me all these people who had signed the wall. That's what they do. Like all important people who come into the booth, sign the wall. And he said, oh, I should have brought you a Sharpie to sign it. And I'm like, I'm a single A broadcaster. Like I'm not that important. I don't need to be signing the wall, you know? Um, and I said, well, like, I'm, I'm going to be back next time. I wanted, I do want to come and do some mock games where I just talk into a tape recorder and get some major league innings as practice that I can send out for reels. And he said, oh yeah, of course, you're definitely welcome to do that. But um, I want you to come do some innings for us. I'm like, on the radio, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm 25 years old. I'm thinking this, this guy's, you know, pulling my leg. I'm not sure if this is really going to happen, but we kept in touch and throughout the year, it just kind of made sense that Dodger Stadium worked because there was going to be a double header. It was a first year major league play by play guy, um, Chris Gariola, who was doing the play by play. And he said, you know, September 18 innings is a lot to do in one day. So let's have you come to Dodger Stadium since it's so close to your hometown and you're going to broadcast those innings. So, I, again, like, what I, what I tell people is just, it's luck, it's networking. And then preparation just really allowed me to have this opportunity with the Diamondbacks. And I've, I've truly enjoyed my, my four years at the Rawhide and my four years in the Diamondbacks organization. It's, it's been a lot of fun. So I feel like I've rambled a lot. That's one of the issues when you ask a broadcaster to come on, I'm going to talk a lot. So (laughs) I'll answer any questions or, or Zach, if you think there's something that I like forgot to talk about. Yeah, so I have a few questions, I guess. I guess uh, you kind of ended with, you know, touching on that experience at Dodger Stadium. Um, And as people can tell, I'm wearing a Giants hat. A lot of people are split between the Giants and A's. You're, you know, an affiliate of the Diamondbacks, but at least in my eyes, Vin Scully is the best there ever was. And walking through Dodger Stadium, especially that Vin Scully press box, and I don't have connections to announcing, but even just the history there gives me the chills. So tell me about just walking into that press box And at Dodger State, like, what's going through your head? Like, how are you processing that? Right. Of all places to make your major league debut, you basically make it where the greatest spent the majority of his career. It's funny, the the two press boxes that I've had the opportunity to work in at the major league level is at Fenway Park and Dodger Stadium now. So pretty, pretty lucky, pretty historic. Um, So I was fortunate enough to arrive to the stadium before the team bus. So I had an opportunity to go into the booth and just take it in myself. And I literally had a wow moment. I walked in and saw Dodger Stadium because this is at 9 a.m. as a day game. And it was just underneath the sun, full glory, like how baseball is supposed to be played. Right. And in the during a day game. And I literally said, wow, out loud. So that was spectacular and and you know of course it's it's Vince Scully it's you got to I got to be in the same area where he's walked where he's a legend he's the best to ever do it it was a wow moment and a dream come true and now I just want more <laughs> <laughs> and tell me about I, I I saw the clips that you posted on Twitter uh and the Diamondbacks post on Twitter uh it was a very interesting quick beginning for you tell me about uh tell us about that Dalton Varsho I haven't even met him he's a legend with the rawhide because he was there the year before I joined and first pitch so Chris announces 
And for the first time in her major league debut, here's Jill Guerin. Thanks, Chris. It's the top of the third inning. I think it was a tied ball game, nothing, nothing. And the first pitch, Dalton Varsho, home run. My my first pitch that I called in, in major leagues was a home run. So um, yeah, I, I homeward on my MLB debut, which is great. Um, honestly, as much as people, it definitely took me by surprise. And if you ever listened to the call, you can tell I didn't put a whole lot of energy into it. Like I probably should have in my defense. It was like a liner line drive that just barely cleared, but it took me by surprise, but it settled me and grounded me so quickly because it was like, all right, this is baseball. You've done this thousands of times. You know how to call an inning. You have an analyst. I'm used to doing this by myself for nine innings. So this is going to be easy. It's just a little bit of a bigger stage. And I am very happy that the first pitch is a home run because I think if it was like a 10 pitch at bat, I would have been fumbling over my words. (laughs) So tell us a little bit too about, um, you know, give us some insights on the California league. Obviously your, 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 main perspective is coming from, you know, raw, uh, you know, the rawhide, but, uh, you know, tell us about some of the stuff that you're seeing, you know, in Visalia and also throughout California, as far as different prospects go, um, you know, different teams that, you know, you see um, developing some great players at that level. For the Diamondbacks, Jordan Lawler is the real deal. I think he's going to be in the majors within two years. Um, He's only, I think he, he just turned 20 a few months ago. Uh, same kind of thing. His first at bat as a member of the Rawhide, he hit a home run. Like it, it was just poetic. Um, he's also a good kid. I think his his shortstop, his defensive ability needs to improve. But again, he's 20. At that age, you make these spectacular plays and you can't make the routine one. That's something that I have seen a lot in the Cal League recently, ever since it went from high A to single A, where I mean, I have 18 year olds on the team. I have the guys who have never, this is their first year in the United States, or if they have been to the United States, it's only Arizona for spring training. And this is their first time, like living in an Airbnb, having to cook. Uh, I had a lot of Latin American players this year where at one point the roster of 30 had eight guys born in the United States. So it's just a very, very different Cal league where in 2019, when it was high A, we still had quite a few Latin American players, but it was no more than 50%. And this, all of the teams, it's not just the Diamondbacks and in the Cal league everywhere, it's more and more international guys. I think that's where we're seeing baseball shift more and more, especially at this younger level. Um, If you've been to a Cal league game in 2019 or before, and now coming after, you're going to see a little bit more mistakes. Honestly, the pitching is not good. This guy is going to have a fantastic slider, but he doesn't know if it's in the strike zone or going to someone's kneecap. They just don't have the control, which is really fun. You're kind of like living as a scout where you're saying, man, this guy's got something. He just has to reel it in. And that is a lot of fun to see these young players potential. Um, As far as the, the the Padres, even though they gave away like half their farm team for um, Juan Soto, like they still won the Cal League championship this year. So if you're a Padres fan, they are up and coming. The Giants always have a good team, the San Jose Giants, which is always a fun ballpark for me to go visit. Um, the Mariners were good this year. Honestly, the Rawhide were just not good. The Rawhide and the Stockton Ports were both teams that had <laughs> some rough years where we weren't above 500 throughout the year. Um, Of course, there'd be some guys here and there that were really good, but for the most part, it was the Padres affiliate and the Giants affiliate and the Mariners were in there a little bit too with some of the best teams in the Cal League this year. So um, Cal League, you you wrap up the Cal League and you you go to Arizona this year. Uh, give us some insight on that experience. Um, yeah, and what you, the prospects that you saw. Obviously, it's a different level, much higher uh, quality ball because you have the, the prospects there. But what are some of the the you know the prospects that you saw and what you, what are your thoughts? I love that? the fall league. It is so much more relaxed than any other. Um, 
I don't, I don't even know how to explain it. Like the first time I went, I didn't understand just how relaxed it is where players usually avoid media, like the plague and a guy, I was just kind of standing by the dugout waiting. And he said, Hey, how are you? Who do you work for? Like he wanted to know what I was doing there. And again, they usually do a wide berth around me unless they know me. Um, so it's, it's a lot of fun. I get opportunities to speak to guys that I know, but maybe haven't seen them in a while. For example, Ronnie Simon, who's now with the Tampa Bay Rays, he was with the Rawhide last year and then was traded. So he's been with three different affiliates in the last three years. He was with the Cubs and then the Diamondbacks and now the Rays. And he was actually one of the sleeper prospects that a lot of um, websites have been writing about where he finished the year in double A and really had a spectacular fall league. And I'm really excited for him to see where um, he keeps going. Um, Jordan Walker is really good. He's at the St. Louis Cardinals. He was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, I'm trying to think of other names. It was it was interesting to see Cooper Hummel there, who is, he just got traded to the Mariners actually from the Diamondbacks. So he isn't the type of guy that you would see in the fall league where he had this amazing year and he's being rewarded by getting to play in the fall league or, okay, he was injured half the year. We need to get him reps. He, he actually has some major league games this year, but they want to see him behind the plate because the automatic automated strike zone is coming soon. And he has a good arm and he used to be a catcher in college, but his framing just kind of wasn't there. They don't need framing as much now. So they were starting to work him there. Um, so I, that was really interesting for me to see how these organizations are using the fall league are they using it as a reward for great prospects are they using it as an injury status where they missed half a season or to experiment with things like cooper hummel so that was honestly the most interesting part for me was talking to um the coaching staff and seeing how that was working i would have an opportunity to reconnect with shane lukes who's actually a san francisco giants world series champion um, he was the pitching coach for the Rawhide in 2019, and he happened to be in the fall league as a pitching coach. And, you know, he can't, he's not going to fix the fundamentals of a pitcher who's not in his organization. That's, he can't do that. The only thing you're really going to be able to talk about is how's your preparation? What's your mindset? How do you get ready for games? And that's the part that Shane really enjoys. He says, I don't really want to teach a guy how to throw a slider, or how to do this or that. I want to, they have these tools already. That's why we signed them. We, I want to help them progress mentally because that's where these guys are going to fail. If they don't make it to the majors, it's not because of their physical ability. It's because of their mental ability. So I think that was really fun to pick his brain and see how he deals with that with the Diamondbacks players, but then also having to deal with five other organizations and their pitchers where they have pitch count regulations different pitches they're allowed to throw, whatever. And he literally like printed this cheat sheet for the manager and for himself. And they hang it on the dugout every day because it's too hard to keep up with all of the rules that they have to follow in the fall league and also the organizations that have rules and it's specific for every player. So I, as you can tell, I, I definitely like the coaching and the player aspect of the sport where learning more about their mental part of the game, learning how coaches prepare. So that's what I look forward to the most in, in the fall league where I get to learn from other organizations, not the D-backs, not only the D-backs. That's, that's interesting that you raised that. And that's something that I had kind of thought of. And I, I, I appreciate you adding those insights because I always did think it's a, a, it would be an awkward situation and a unique situation for a coach with a particular organization going to the Arizona Fall League. And obviously you want to show what you can do as a coach, but yet at the same time, um, you know, enhancing or other organizations' prospects is, is kind of a unique uh, scenario for you. So I appreciate you adding those. Um, I think I've talked enough. We do have some questions in the um, in the chat, and then um, we'll have obviously the opportunity to for folks to you know to unmute themselves and ask questions as well. Um, I guess Marlene, if you you can you have one in the chat, but if you wanted to ask it by unmuting yourself, that would be fine. Hi, thanks, Joe. This is really interesting. Um, and it looks like you're having fun too, which is great. Um, I'm curious about your preparation 
and about how detailed your scorebook is that you keep during the game. And then do you speak Spanish? I'm working on Spanish. It has improved immensely. I'm lucky enough to, I took you know, three years of it in high school. I'm from Los Angeles, so it made sense to take that. But I have learned immensely. I feel like I have the verbs down. Conjugating is really hard and not just the present tense, but then there's the past and the future. And I probably sound like a five-year-old trying to speak Spanish, but the, the guys appreciate it. And then they feel comfortable practicing English with me. So that's really helped me become close with a lot of the Latin American players. As, as far as my preparation, it's actually really hard at the single A level to research these guys. There's nothing on them unless they're, they went to college. There'll be people like, like Jordan Lawler, who's a top prospect where you know everything about him but he only played in high school. So we don't know any, there's no college stats. There's a little bit of high school stats if you go to like max prep, but that's not a whole lot. Um, and then specifically the Latin American players, unless they're a top prospect, top 30, there's nothing on them. So a lot of my preparation is doing the bare minimum of, you know, Googling their name, looking up different things here and there just to see if there is something, but a lot of it, I have to dig out of these guys, which I've been fortunate enough to be in this organization for four years. So I, I know, I know these players or they know someone who knows me and they can say, no, Jill's cool. You can talk to her. She's not going to, you know, screw you over or something. So um, in particular for me, this was my best year in terms of my um, relationship with players where in 2019, first year in minor league baseball. No one knew who I was. Then we had the pandemic and we went down to single A in 2021. So I didn't have a single player on that team that I knew. Uh, and then this year we had some guys back from last year. So I had a good relationship with them. Very laid back, chill. We like to have fun, joke around. These other guys see that and they realize, okay, we can talk to her. So a lot of my preparation outside of the normal researching is going down to batting practice and just talking to them and not in a very formal ma manner. I don't really like to do that. I'll do that for a pregame show, but I prefer to just talk to them. And if I see the coaching staff instructing them on something, I'll ask them about it and say, what is it that they're trying to fix? Or I'll talk to a coaching staff and say, what exactly is that here? Particularly, I'll do that if there is a roving coach who's here working with a player and they have a little bit more information. It's just a new person to talk to to get some new information. Um, my book is pretty basic. I don't write a whole lot of notes. If there's one fun story that I heard recently, I'll write that kind of in the top corner of my scorebook to remind myself. But I do a pretty straightforward book with just substitutions, the straight nine. Um, my game notes, I do, depending on the day, two to four pages of game notes where just information on the last game, uh, newest arrivals for the players. Um, I will, if someone has a hitting streak or something, I'll note that on the front page. The second page is the starting pitcher. At this level, we have a lot of piggybackers where a pitcher will go two innings and then we have scheduled next guy coming in. So I'll do a full in-depth thing on him. And then I try to have other pages with the batters and the pitchers. Pitchers is mainly just like last appearance outing, um, what they throw batters are. Do they have a hit streak? Did they play last game? What are they doing this series? Just little statistics that are good to throw in. Cause again, I'm, I'm talking to myself for nine innings. So. So, so you keep, these are your notes, which you keep to refer to through the season. Do you mm -hmm. share them with other staff or anybody? Yeah, I give them to the, the visiting broadcaster. We tend to, to share those with nice. each other. but and, and I'll print them for scouts or for media members if they want them, but not many people cover us, so I don't have to worry about it too much. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Um, another question in the chat. You kind of alluded to this earlier, uh, but as far as the level now, um, I imagine more, you, you referenced uh, a large amount of Latin players, but as far as those born in the States, I would imagine more high school than college players than just a year or two ago. 
Yeah, I would say so. Um, Jordan Lawler was out of high school. We, uh, the Diamondbacks just uh, drafted Drew Jones, who's out of high school. So it, it's funny at the beginning of the year, I'll have the high school guys who finished in the Arizona uh, complex league last year after the draft at the end of the year, once the draft happens, I'm getting all the college guys immediately. And they're here maybe for a week or two, and then they're bumped up to high a. So it is a very interesting um, way. I think with how the draft has changed, they're kind of figuring it out. I think their, their goal is to keep high schoolers in the complex league when they're straight right after they're drafted. And then the next year they start at single a and they'll move up from there. That's the strategy that I've seen at least with the diamondbacks. And I, I, I would guess based off the rosters that I remember, I think that's about the same. The Modesto nuts did it a little bit differently. Uh, the last two years, actually, they've had very heavy uh, college heavy um, rosters, which is why they've been like spectacular in the beginning of the year. Cause they have <laughs> 22 year olds going up against 18 year olds is a senior versus a freshman, basically, but the diamondbacks and a majority of the teams that I know are doing high school first, then college. Um, and we have, we have Tracy who, um, referenced that she is here as a Sabre member. Um, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, are you getting to travel as much or are the, there still COVID restrictions on broadcaster travel? And how glamorous is that single A travel? So the Cal League is the best league in the country for travel. Um, I have been able to travel in 2021. Um, they still sent me on the road, but I had to drive myself to a majority of the places until about June, I want to say, then they allowed me on the bus, which honestly was a little ridiculous because I was on the, um, I forget the word, but like on the list of people who were allowed to be in contact with the players who were allowed to be in the clubhouse. And I'm thinking like, all right, I'm in the clubhouse with them. I can't be on the bus with them. Like I'm on the list of people, whatever, like I'll drive, (laughs) you know, I'm I'm happy to go on the road because it was my first year going on the road. Um, No more really COVID restrictions. If people have symptoms, they test, but um, that's really it. The issue is if you test, you still have to wait. You have to wait until you get a negative test again. And so we've had one player who is towards the end of the year and he just couldn't test negative and he just didn't play the rest, which was really unfortunate for him. But um, I've been lucky enough to travel these last two years, which has been great. This last year, I took the bus for a majority of the road trips. And the Cal League is great because I'm in this like smack dab in the middle of California in Visalia. Visalia. The longest road trip I have is four to five hours, which is nothing. So um, it's fine. We're staying in much better hotels because of the PDL where we um, can no longer be in motels so we actually like can't walk outside of our door and see like the sky it has to be an actual hotel with hallways which is nice because last year I was in a motel where like if we had to stay there again this year my dad said he was going to pay for my hotel room somewhere else because it was just not (laughs) safe at all Um, I had one hotel room where the door didn't latch fully I had to literally like body slam it to get it to close so Um, not glamorous, but it's getting better for sure. Honestly, the, the worst part about travel for me is the, the bus. If I have to use the restroom, because like, like, I'm sorry, but like, like dudes, like on a moving bus, there's spillage. I'm a girl, (laughs) you know? So I've started to um, become friendly with the coaches and be like, if it's longer than four hours, we have to stop at some point, please. You know, um, which is something that I've had a really fun conversation with the coaching staff. It's actually kind of a nice little icebreaker for the first road trip, which is good. <laughs> um, and, and Perry, I guess if you, you could unmute yourself and you could ask your question if you, if you'd like. Sure. Hi, Jill. So great of you to tell us all about your your amazing life and career. It's just so cool. And I, I particularly love it that your mother 
planted the seed mm -hmm. because my, my mother did that for me too with umpiring. So I, I feel a kindred spirit <laughs> with you in that sense. So um, my question is, you were talking earlier about uh, the team doing so poorly in the standings. And I'm wondering, how do you keep, how do you stay positive and upbeat when you're doing the announcing in the booth about a team that, you know, stinks? And yeah. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you have to um, consider not being overly critical because, you know, of the position that you're in or, you know, because of sponsors or something like that. I'm really curious about that, how you sort of um, balance, you know, wanting to, you know, speak your truth and speak the truth about the team with, you know, being tactful and diplomatic and, and keeping your job. <laughs> right. It's, it's keeping my job and it's being able to get on that bus without them throwing me off it the next right. day. Right. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, um, yeah, of course. So a lot of what I say is I'll critique and then say, but they're really young. <laughs> That's a phrase that I say a lot. Um, I tend, if it's a physical error, I'm not going to go into that as much because everyone could see what happens. So for those of you, I do radio and TV stream at home. So I do simulcast. So I do a radio broadcast, but a majority of the people I'd say are leaning towards minor league baseball right now, especially the players' families. And, and that's another thing. These players' families are watching. Like I am critiquing their 20 year old son. So I'm trying, I've heard stories of like moms e writing letters and emailing broadcasters to stop hating on their sons, basically. So I don't want to get that. Um, a lot of it will be more statistical we had one player who had one hit in an entire month and I'm not going to go into it a whole lot other than GJ Hill is one for 43 or SP Chen has not had a hit in 20 games you know like something like that I'm not going to go any more into it than statistical when it comes mm -hmm. to mental errors of he picked up the ball looked at third should have thrown a first and eventually threw it a first but it was too late I'll go into that a little bit more into this is why they should have done it this way or, and I'll even give them the benefit of the doubt and say, I could see why he wanted to go to third to get the main out wanting to be the hero, but he needs to know as a pitcher, you just need to throw it a first and get the out. Like I'll do it in a benefit of the doubt way that might change throughout my career as I move up to other levels. But right now at this level, I don't think I need to be you know, criticizing this guy and saying he needs to get released or anything like that. Um, I just don't, I just don't see a need for it, especially as the voice of a team. You don't want to listen to a broadcaster who's hating on the team that they're supposed to be the voice of. If I'm doing ESPN or MLB network, yeah, all right, I'll be more critical. But at this point, they don't, I don't need to be doing that. All right. Thank you. And uh, just a, a quick question. How's the umpiring in the league? I mean, you talk about the players <laughs> being young and inexperienced. I'm curious yeah. about the, the quality of the umpiring at that level. They are either really good at one part of it, but they're not good at all of it. So like someone's strike zone won't be consistent, but they'll be really good when they're on the bases. They're not going to be good at both. I think the biggest thing is you can see that they're young and they're, I understand they're trying to like be in control of the pace of the game. And I appreciate that but I can see them over umpiring. Um, the best example I have is there were benches didn't clear, but there was some issues between our catcher and the batter and our manager came sprinting over to get his catcher, our catcher out of the way. And the umpire tried to block the manager from protecting his own player. And, uh, you know, again, he's young and I'm never an umpire. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So is, it was just different. Um, that's my best example of that. But yeah, they're they're interesting. Do you have any major league prospects? <laughs> <laughs> for, for umpiring? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's one Thank that you. I like. There's one, Cass, Cass Cousins. He's good. I think his dad is an umpire too, so. All right, well, I'll keep my eye out for him. <laughs> Thanks. All right. 
Um, a next question in here, and, and I gotta, I'll preface this question by saying when I used to uh, spend summers at my grandparents in Tulare, one of the highlights was to go was to go to Visalia Oaks games. Mm -hmm. But to be completely blunt, 30 plus years ago, it was Recreation Park. I can't recall what it's called now, but it was not a good stadium. Yeah. And there's been huge improvements to Visalia over the last, what was it, about 15 years or so ago, 20 years ago, maybe even, um, which has made it actually one of the better A-ball parks. Uh, but the question is, as far as the Cal League, best ballparks, the ones that are, maybe we don't have to say worst ballpark, but the uh, uh, the ones that could need improvement. <laughs> it's it's so tough because they all have their own character. Like the ones that have been around for so long, like it, you said, it used to be called Recreation Park and now it's Valley Strong Ballpark. We had naming rights done uh, two years ago. Us and then San Jose Giants. It's, it's now called Excite Ballpark. Like we have old stadiums and it's not the best seating or not the best when it comes to where the sun is setting really bad clubhouses it's it's tough to be able to keep up with that when you've been around for 75 plus years and then you have these massive stadiums like the diamond and like elsinore that you feel so far away from the game um, I, I really like the older ballparks where you're up close and personal, like in, in Visalia, especially if there's not a lot of people in the stands, like I can hear conversations between the umpire and the catcher. And I, I like that kind of thing. Um, I love excite ballpark in San Jose. I love the old timey feel. It makes me feel at home. Um, I like Rancho a lot, Rancho Cucamonga. I think it's just a very nice, like kind of cookie cutter, but not really just nice basic ballpark. You know, it's big, but not so big that you feel like you can't fill the stadium. It has a good, um, has a good number of fans that come. So Rancho is one of my, my favorite places to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you, well, would you recommend Arizona Fall League games? And I guess what we could, I'll, I'll rearrange that question is, um, you know, what would you recommend uh, when you do go to Arizona Fall League games? Like, kind of like the whole uh, vibe of that particular league or, uh, you know, maybe how it varies from spring training, how, um, you know, what, kind, what do you expect when you go to an Arizona Fall League game? It almost feels like an exhibition game, I think, in spring at spring training, where all of a sudden one day, because they use so many pitchers earlier in the week, that it's all seven inning games and you find out 24 hours ahead of time. So it's very different. You kind of need to just kind of go with the flow, especially if you're kind of like an, an old school baseball fan of, oh, why isn't the best player playing right now? You know, what's the fall league? Like Jordan Lawler was one of the best players. He's only playing three days a week, which is normal in the fall league. So I would recommend going for multiple days, especially if you want to try to see all of the prospects that like on your, are your home team, your favorite team, try to watch them for like two games. And then if you want to go to another park for two games, I recommend that because then you're probably going to see a majority of your top prospects play. Um, a question from Daryl. Um, I know that when we, we've talked in the past, when you joined uh, the Rawhide, there were th three female broadcasters in all of minor league baseball. Uh, what are the numbers now and how do you, you know, kind of support each other um, as that number is growing. I think it's technically two now, actually. The, oh, wow. I thought you said yeah. it went up to six. It <laughs> did. So it, it's complicated. It depends on how you want to say it. If I'm talking about the lead voice of a broadcast, there's now only two of us. Kristen Carbaugh, who was with Reading, um, is still in baseball, but she's no longer broadcasting. Um, Maura Sheridan, who was with the Lynchburg Hillcats, she has now transitioned to soccer and she's now doing broadcasting at ESPN. So an amazing like jump for her, but they didn't hire a woman after that. 
And I have another friend who has been with the team, but she's currently looking for um, a different opportunity. So right now there's two of us who have jobs as the lead broadcaster in minor league baseball. But as far as support group, we have a group chat um, that we just, I mean, we, we talk every single day because quite frankly, there are a total of about four people in this entire planet who understands what I go through every day as a woman broadcaster. So we have to stay pretty close. Although I just came back from one of their weddings last month. So. All right. Um, looks like that is the end of the questions in the chat. Um, you can still add some questions in the chat or uh, Daryl, I think that last question was yours. Do you have your hand up because you wanted to ask a, an additional question or follow up or? I do actually, thanks Zach. I just I had a quick comment to make really not a question for Jill. Uh, first of all, Jill, this has been really, really interesting. I appreciate this and your career. Um, and I know you said it's uh, luck and um, networking, but I would say it's also talent and initiative, both of which you have. Thank you. So I just wanted to comment on that. And this is great. As that's all I wanted to say. This Thank great you. Day. I appreciate it. I've really enjoyed this. Thanks. Cool. Okay. Any other questions or comments or anything like that from Jill or for Jill? Where where do you uh -oh. see your uh, career going um, sooner and then later? Or, or where would you like to see your career going sooner and then later? Yeah, it's, it's, it's no secret. I have loved my time with the Rawhide and you know, I'd be more than happy to go back. I just feel like I am ready to take the next step and just go on another adventure. And, and I'm comfortable saying this, like everyone at the Rawhide knows that. They've basically said, you know, can you just let us know by like, March, if you're going to come back or not. <laughs> um, so, so it's, it's one year contracts. Yes. Yeah. One year contract. That's so it's really interesting, actually, how minor league baseball works with broadcasting. It's the assumption is you are going to come back. Like you have a conversation at the end of the year and say, yeah, I'd love to have an opportunity to come back and provided you don't royally mess up. They usually say, yes, please do. Um, and you just let them know if it's not going to happen. And quite frankly, there are probably a thousand people right now who would take my job in a heartbeat. They don't even have to make a posting. They just would hear that I'm leaving and they will have a thousand emails the next morning asking for a job. So that's how intense this job market is. As far as myself, I don't have any, you know, solid leads for this next year. So if y'all know of anyone looking for a broadcaster, let me know. Um, but the, the end goal is to be the voice of a major league team. I'm not very particular if I want radio or TV, I'm open to either. I'm also open to color analysts, not just play by play. Mm -hmm. That is something that a lot of people have told me to focus in on because it is such a unique perspective as a former player, but also being a woman and being someone where players have connected with me so easily. And I think that's because I'm a woman, they don't feel threatened by me. They see me trying to relate to them, trying to speak their language, I'm, I mean, I connect with all of their girlfriends. I think I'm friends with all their girlfriends on Instagram instead of them, you know? Um, so I think being an analyst would also be great, but my, my goal is to be the voice of a major league team someday. This is a personal question. Can you make a living on the salary of a minor league broadcaster? Decent. A lot of people end up doing um, basketball play-by-play -play on the side. I've like oh, really okay. focused in on softball and baseball where I'm doing a little bit more basketball play-by-play um, -play and other games. I've been producing high school football games. I also like dog sit and babysit on the side, <laughs> things like that, you know, but um, <laughs> fortunate enough to, you know, not have to worry. I, I, I make enough to live in Visalia, yeah. not enough to, you know, live by myself in Los Angeles or anything, but um, enough to survive. The best do, of you, do you have to get winter employment? Do they pay your salary during the off season? And so it depends. Some broadcasters are year round. They stay on as marketing, social media, event planning. Um, I was reduced to seasonal this past year, which was actually a mutually um, agreed upon thing because I during the pandemic year, the COVID year in 21, I was also the director of marketing and I got 
burned out. Like I, I found my breaking point. I had never hit one before, but I had hit a point where I felt inadequate at everything that I did because the marketing was lacking. The broadcasting was lacking. I wasn't doing well at any part of my job. So we had a conversation. We all agreed that it was just better for me to be seasonal, um, which has allowed me to do more opportunities like the Arizona Fall League, like the Big West Conference Tournament for the women's basketball um, tournament in, in Vegas in March. There's things like that. It's, it's also allowed me to like be home, see my parents. You know, I'm, I'm not a human for six months during baseball season. If people want to see me, they have to come to Visalia or another stadium to see me. So it's, I, I enjoy being seasonal. It's a nice break. Uh, Paul, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you, uh, Jill. This has been great. I just had one question about um, the Cal League going from, uh, you know, upper A to, to lower A. I've been a Cal League fan for years, and I saw it this year in Stockton. It was just amazing. Uh, you know, Rob Manfred is just not one of my favorite people. I just wanted to ask you about how he's She's trying to looking for upper mobility here. So minor leagues. Careful <laughs> how you ask that question, Paul. <laughs> but it's 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 a it's a real it's a real problem. I mean, really, if you're from Fresno, you're not happy, right? So, in, in terms of like the fans with with the move down, there was yeah. definitely negative comments. Particular, so the Rawhide were were with the Diamondbacks. You know, we don't pull Dodger fans or giant fans, people in Visalia are legitimate Visalia fans where they are host families and they follow these guys everywhere. They're invited to these guys' weddings. We're so close to the field too, that like they'll get fist bumps from the players during uh, when they're on the on-deck circle, things like that. So um, at first there were negative comments. I, I mean, I think we would get more negative comments about changing our name from the Oaks to the Rawhide, which was 13 years ago. Like people are more upset about that than the actual move. Um, one thing that we try to remind people is this is exciting. It's very, very rare for someone to skip single A. They might skip high A or only be there for a little bit, but these top prospects like Jordan Lawler, they are starting their career in Visalia. I, I witnessed, I called Jordan Lawler's first professional home run. And that's something that we just try to like remind people that it's still minor league baseball. You're going to see more dumb mistakes. You're seeing college age guys playing. So they're going to make a little bit more mistakes. There's going to be some sloppier games, but it's still minor league baseball. And it's still really beautiful. All right. Um, any other questions before we wrap up the the evening? How far down uh, ha have the um, technological advances being used in Major League Baseball infiltrated? Um, do they use uh, pitch clocks, um, instant replay? What what do they? What's going on at your level? So we have pitch clocks. We don't have the automated strike zone. I don't even know how we would get that thing into our old ballpark, honestly. Okay. Um, but we have pitch clocks, which I am a fan of. Let me tell you, my goodness. Me when too. You to yourself for three hours and it ends up being on an average of two and a half hours. Fantastic. Um, Absolutely. As far as other technology that you see behind the scenes, we have TrackMan. Some other people have things called Hawkeye where it tracks the pitches so they know what pitch, what the spin rate is, everything. They know everything now, um, which is fantastic for these guys where then the video coordinators who don't have particularly like difficult hard jobs, just long jobs, because after the game, they um, have to submit all of this information and have it ready for the guys to look at the next morning. So that at this young level, the low level, they are getting immediate feedback on their swing still. Not as immediate as you see with the iPads in Major League Baseball, but next day immediate at least. So Daryl has a, you have another question, Daryl? Yes, this is quick. So Joe, how do you think you did in your, how, how do you think you did in your Dodger Stadium uh, job and debut there 
I had more positive comments than negative. So that's good. <laughs> you know, my, my mom's, and I'm actually home for the holidays. My mom's going to hear me say this and probably be mad, but she's my hardest critic. And she texts, she texts me after most games and say, she gives me like a letter grade. She's a teacher. So she gives me a letter grade of the broadcast. And she told me that I had an A and that was the first ever A I've gotten from her. So it was good. <laughs> Very good. All right. We'll give one last opportunity for questions before we wrap it up. Anybody else? Me, do you have a seat? Sorry, and I, I did raise my hand. Do, are you work? Do you have a, a signature call? I don't. So I'm not a fan of that because, like, baseball is so unique. Every, mm -hmm. Like a ground ball to short, yeah. There's a lot of ground balls to short, and they're very similar, but they're still different, especially home runs. I think I have phrases that I tend to say more. I'll if it's down the line, I'll tend to say it has the distance. If it's fair. Um, if I'm not sure if it's going to get out of here, I'll say, does it have the distance? It does. Um, honestly, I think a phrase that I say the most isn't even about like home runs. It's about making fun of myself because again, I'm talking to myself for a long time where <laughs> this happened, where the first time I said this, it was a ground rule double. And I swear to God, I thought it was a home run. And it was, then I realized, oh no, it's a ground rule double. And then all of a sudden I see the player walking back home and I'm thinking, I'm like, and I'm literally saying on air, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why he's coming back to the plate. I don't know if there was timeout called. I don't know what's going on. And then someone in the booth next to me was like hearing me and they were like foul ball. I'm like, <laughs> and so I said, all right, there's a foul ball. First error of the game goes to the broadcaster. That's an E Jill. And now every time I <laughs> have an oops, I say E Jill, which I probably should like stop harping on my mishaps, um, <laughs> but eh, makes it fun. So Rawhide Games are, we could find you on the yeah, so um, if you want to listen just on radio, there is the free um, MILB app. It's called uh, oh, right my first pitch and then if you want to like pay for the subscription of MILB TV you can also do that but road and home are audio on first pitch and home is video on MILB TV nice. Zach you'll have to like... remind us next season <laughs> yeah absolutely Send us links. Very cool. thank you All this right. has been great thank you this has been great thank you so much Jill and thank you everybody for joining us um We'll go ahead and uh, wrap things up for the evening, but uh, this will be, uh, this has been recorded and it will be on YouTube within the next day or two. Uh, so if you joined us late or, uh, or if you have other folks that may uh, want to listen to this, I'll definitely make sure that it's available. Just any kind of keywords um, that would make sense, you'll make sure to be able to find it on, on YouTube. So thanks again, Jill. We really appreciate you spending the evening with us. Um, yeah. And uh, hopefully next time I see you in uh, Visalia, um, uh, hopefully sometime this next year. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone, for having me. This is a blast. Thank All you. right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks again. Zach. All right. Thanks. Good night. Thanks. All right. Thanks, man. It's really good. Hi, Marlene. Uh,